Shall we go for Shall it? Shall we go? Um, hello, welcome. Thank you very much for coming. Um, so for anyone that came to the session earlier, you're not stuck in a terrible time warp. Um, <laughs> we're not going to go over um, talking about me uh, again. This is actually time to turn the tables on to Steve. Um, who did a great job interviewing me, so no pressure. Thank you. <laughs> However, this afternoon it's all about this gentleman here. So I'd like to welcome Stephen Michael Moore, who is author of The Washington Adventure, a man of, of great talents. Um, the Washington Adventure is his debut novel and was published last year, and it's a wonderful, laugh out loud, funny adventure that deftly marries. Um, history with comedy, and is about a rather lovable buffoon called William Peel, Lord of Tornbridge, um, who although filthy rich, has rather unsurprisingly given his enormous ineptitude, um, blown much of his fortune, or lost much of his fortune, and sails to America with the hope of securing a lucrative land deal. Um, only to discover that he's rocked up on the eve of the British invasion with hilarious consequences. Hilarious consequences ensue. Yeah. Yeah. Hilarious consequences ensues. <laughs> it's very funny. Um, so it was a gold medal winner on HarperCollins International um, book platform, Orthonomy, um, reaching number one in late 2013, and was the highest rated comedy on the site, which we'll talk a little bit more about that later, I hope. Um, Steve is a local author, so you may all know him already. Um, he's a skill set shortlisted uh, screenwriter, uh, Master of Arts in screenwriting yes. from the Northern Film School, and through his consultancy company, Click Imagination, he's worked um, on numerous projects for t uh, TV, film, and radio. Um, and Steve also went down an, uh, a publishing route that I know many people are interested in, in that he independently published this. So hopefully we'll talk about that a little bit later on as well. First though, I'd like to ask you about the Washington Adventure. So I've given a little bit, a taster of what it's about, but can you, in your own words, tell us a bit more about what the story is about? Yeah, it's um, uh, about uh, Lord of Tornbridge, William Peel, who is, um, uh, in effect, the wealthiest family in the world at a time when there wasn't banks um, in the same way as we see them today. So there were financiers to, uh, for all sorts of things. The family financed Napoleon's campaigns in Europe and um, cladding of the, uh, the ships at Trafalgar. They don't steer any particular line, they just fund and return money. Um, the previous generation was quite sort of shrewd um, and had was respected by kings and queens but the father charles unfortunately dies of smoke inhalation on his son william's 18th birthday so he's coming of age william suddenly inherits this enormous fortune and responsibility um, but he's very young um, he's not quite financially focused or well, byron described him as having the financial acumen of a footstool um, so he's 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 determining world policy in effect, but he's not really particularly prepared to, uh, to do that. Um, so the story then is about um, his, uh, in context, America, Washington is the new capital city of, of, uh, of America, um, and they want money for, uh, re not rebuilding, but building Washington. So that's, they come to, to, to the Peels to try and fund uh, the expansion. Um, and um, and the story is then about uh, William trying to service that debt. And as uh, Jason says, he arrives in Washington at the, at the time when the British are invading. Just for wider context, the War of 1812, which is the backdrop for the story, was America declared war on Britain. Um, they didn't particularly have great terms as to what exactly they wanted, but they, they declared war on Britain. And the reason they declared it principally was because Britain was part of the coalition fighting Napoleon, so they were desperately overstretched. Um, and, um, but on, in uh, spring of 1814, Napoleon abdicated, and uh, the story really picks up where um, the British Prime Minister had said to, uh, the, uh, to Wellington, send your 
elite over to Washington with orders to raise hell. So that's the historical um, background, often called the, the, the forgotten war. So, and actually, I mean, like, William is such a, is such a, I mean, he's a buffoon, but he's a really lovable buffoon, and he's a great three-dimensional character. So did you start with him, or, I mean, actually, the, the period of history is really rich as well. So where, where did the scene come from? Was it the, the, that moment in history, or, or was it from the character itself? It started with the moment, it's, it, the first light on moment was even understanding that the British had marched into Washington and destroyed the capital. Because I had no concept of that before. It seemed like such an enormous thing, but yet I didn't know that that happened. Uh, so that seemed like a good hook. But as, this, as starting to understand what a story might look like around that, and at the time I wasn't actually, although it's a sort of story now, there's a point where research becomes a story, then it sort of, no, that's not going to quite work. And you do more research and you, it starts to shape something. It's a bit like chiseling away for a you know, stonemason, I guess, just roughly getting some kind of shape that might work. And um, I then sort of had the dilemma that if you're doing an historical event about the destruction of Washington, which is quite a major event really in history, which side are you going to tell it from? Are you going to do it from the side of the Americans or from the British? Because it's very much an army driven thing. And that was the bit that I didn't particularly want to do, because then you're getting drawn into having to take a a political side, if you like. Um, so the idea was to try and get somebody in right in the middle of that action. Um, and because of unearthing things about America, about the fact that they, they actually declared war without a bank and without an army. So it's pretty, pretty brave uh, to do that fundamentally. So I thought, OK, I like the idea of it then being financier. Um, and because of all of this seriousness, um, it's like you've got all the sort of pathos there, suddenly it's like, how are you going to make comedy? You put comedy into balance against the pathos to try and take the serious edge out of it, but also to be a foil to make it comedic. So it's very serious events, but actually mm -hmm. you can use that comedy as a way to, it heightens the comedy really. So that was, yeah, so it was, it was the events first and then discovering the most likely character that would inhabit right. that. So you think, are, you, are you a historian at heart as a writer, or are you a comedy writer? I didn't. First? I'm a comedy writer first. Um, but history is addictive, isn't it? It's and research is addictive, and I, I, it took about twelve months to research. Um, because the one thing I found over this particular period is, you think that the history books are accurate. And the not there's loads of contradictory things that says because the history is written by the writers by people that have an opinion about what they want to present and as i started to, to research it was obvious that um an addictive the fact that you uncover so suddenly you find that actually america didn't have a bank i didn't discover that until quite later on you go that's phenomenal because that's what banks were at historically that's why banks were formed so that that kings and queens <coughs> could raise money for war so to do it without actually having a, a ban. And then reversely as well, because um, we had all the stuff with the banking crisis. Ironically, the reason why America didn't have a bank was because in 1811, they considered that, or just actually leading up to 1811, they considered that banks were becoming too profiteering to, to foreign countries. Um, and it was becoming more about them and exploiting their the American people. So they decided that the license wouldn't be renewed. Um, so there was an element of things starting to come together that, uh, that that were interesting from a historical point of view, but just add fuel to the fire yeah. of comedy. So where do you decide? I mean, there's a lot of historical fact in this book, but obviously you're, you you bend the facts ever so slightly in places mm -hmm. because obviously you're writing comedy comedy stories. So where how do you decide where you're going to stick to exactly what happened and and when are you going to sort of step over the line and get into the realms of imagination? Where's the, where's the um, choice? I, I like. I want the facts to be to be correct. So somebody is in. I don't change the fact that somebody was in some place mm. at a particular time. If I've got some evidence of that, if there's not evidence of it, I think I've got a space to work with. Yes. Yeah. So I, I try and keep sort of sincere to the fact that. Um, uh, 
if a person is getting from here to here, the journey is my territory. Uh, but I don't change the fact yeah. that that person wasn't there uh, for two reasons. One of which because I think if you do that, it becomes very complicated because it's like a lie. And then you have to, if you wanted to do another part of the story, you'd have to change the, the reinvent yes, the lies yeah. and the truth again in order to make it work. Whereas it's much easier if you can just get a sort of Oxford history book off the shelf and go, oh, yes, that was, and then weave the, the magic around mm -hmm. it. So that's the, that's the first bit. The other bit is... I quite like a, a set parameter to work in. I find that I work quite well. If somebody gives me a tight brief, you can sort of, the fun is peering through where the gaps mm -hmm. are and then getting the characters to, to work in that, uh, in that world and fit to what's already happened. Yeah, I think it's quite hard to keep it controlled if you've got access all areas and there's, yeah. no, yeah, there's no fence around you to keep, keep the story sort of contained. Yeah. Um, and, and you delve quite, you know, wonderfully into some of the big themes of the time, like slavery and, you know, the, the power of the aristocracy and, and, or the misuse of power of the aristocracy. Yeah. And so, so were these, these larger themes a conscious decision in terms of the, this is what you wanted to cover in the book? Or were these things that fed in slowly, um, sort of subconsciously as you were doing the writing? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the slavery, just as one example, slavery, I, um, as part of the story, Washington needs slaves to be built, and it was built on slave labour. So uh, part of the story is an inducement to seal this, this deal that William's after. He decides that he will service the need for slaves in, in Washington mm -hmm. by taking slaves uh, across. So it's very much the early part of the book is supposed to be a simple transaction of go to Africa, get some slaves, then across the Atlantic and arrive in America. Um, complications ensue for the, for, the, for the beginning of that, but it is um, uh, that journey nevertheless. And in, in that process, I, in my mind, when I first started plotting it, I'd like, oh, I've got some slaves, and I've got them in a boat, and then we've gone across, and then they're going to get sold. But actually, a story about a boat moving across the Atlantic for 30 odd days, what's that going to be about then? How's that going to work? I don't need to suddenly go from, from here to here, because no, no matter how much sort of plotting, it's like you've just lost a month, what's happened in that period. So I needed to cover it. And, and so I, I, I started to read some books about sea travel and how they act, what the ships were like, how people lived on them from the day to day and how slaving ships would work. Um, and, and started to get an idea of how horrible slavery was which sounds incredibly naive doesn't it it's like you not think that slavery is bad you have to read a book on it uh, but it, it was it's hard to imagine that there was sort of 300 slaves in an area where in shelves basically in the in the hull of a ship that you couldn't even stand up in um chained all the time um using even a toilet would be an exaggeration a bucket between about 10 of them with no privacy um, diet, all that sort of thing. So you, I suddenly started to learn things that were quite, I felt an obligation that I needed to make that point. I needed to explain a little bit about how it would work, about what they went through. But perversely, and it is perversely, then is to say, but I'm not a history writer, I'm not a historian. I don't, I don't want to write a book that's about those slaves going, I want it's a comedy. Mm -hmm. So I then had to find a way to make that journey funny and to, to have such tragedy about the fact that the, you know, the, the, with illness, uh, there's, there's a bit in it where there's, there's sort of a slave guy who's almost view is that he, if there's anything wrong, he sort of chucks him over the side. Um, and it, I think there's, there's a comment where William said he, he wouldn't need a map to get home. He could see the bobbing slaves that have sort of marked the route. Um, and you would have, say, 300 at the start of the journey through illness, dysentery, and other, you might have 100. You know, that, and that's just business. It's like that's damaged fruit if you were... You know, if you were transport, transporting oranges, and that's just horrible. But there's some comedy in there yeah. to, to use it in a perverse way if it's handled correctly. I think that's yeah, it's a great way of bringing up those kind of you know the the, the nasty side of history and those things that we you know the, the disgust us now. But actually, you no, know, actually, when you think about stand-up comedians, they can delve into some really difficult mm. subject areas just by using the comedy. I think you do that brilliantly in this. Um, 
So for me, and actually in terms of the comedy, I, I think there's sort of elements of the far show and the League of Gentlemen, and there's there's a bit of carry on thrown in. Always says following his chest. <laughs> <laughs> um, did they inspire the programs like that, or TV and, and film inspire you, or uh, is it mainly from in, other books? In the actually in the comedy, the, the comedy of the character William Peel, actually is probably the most layered and complicated character I've ever written. Mm -hmm. He's also the one I enjoy writing more than others. Um, and it's because he's, he's quite he's complicated. Certain parts of him, his relationship with Samuel, who is the sort of village idiot. So he's the basic premise in my mind between Samuel. Wi William is, is incredibly rich, but doesn't really have genuine friends. Um, because there's a that barrier both from his personality because he can be a bit of a buffoon and, and not objectionable and, and deliberately bad but he's been given everything all his life so he's, you just f fill that space that you're given but then samuel is is sort of the mirror of that that he's just the village idiot with nothing and actually he adores william um so he's it, perversely the only person william would want and he doesn't he doesn't like any personal contact at all william he's sort of you know he doesn't want to be touched or certainly by a commoner so the, the idea of having Samuel who's a village idiot who actually really loves him and, and, and wants to just go into the fray with him um, that relationship was was sort of um, uh, uh, Laurel and Hardy they make a great double act mm. don't they and I think he's so and I found Samuel so endearing mm. I think that actually I mean the, 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 the scene near the beginning where actually for the uh, Punishment for setting fire. Oh yeah, setting fire to the setting house. Setting fire to the house. He gets rolled down a hill in a barrel, and mm -hmm. and everyone thinks, "Oh my God, his brains are going to be shaken all over the place." And they, you know, they crank it, crank it open, and get him out. And he's like, "Again, again, again, <laughs> again!" It <laughs> was great fun. Um, and I just love. I mean, you meet people like that in real life. I think that it's mm -hmm. kind of like just full of positivity. And actually, I think that you know that makes him. No, just very charming to be with. And I, I, I loved it's it, the fact that he burnt he burnt the house down. Basically, he, he um, premises that he'd fallen asleep in the hayloft, and um, there is there is a twist to this actually. But it, it opens with he'd fallen asleep in the hayloft, and um, the, the lamp his lamp had fallen on his backside and set fire to the whole thing. So he, his bottom had burnt down the biggest, grandest house in the whole of Europe <laughs> um, and destroyed millions in, in valuable art and in the, at his trial if you like um you know the the, the judges remarked on that and samuel view is that he will try and pay it off <laughs> yeah. the guy says well, something like um oh i don't mind working weekends or something exactly. <laughs> yes he's, you know he's, and his job is he, sh he shovels yeah. dung for a living but actually he doesn't even have a shovel uh, <laughs> but yeah he's gonna he's gonna pay off the destruction yeah. of one of the wealthiest families homes in, in the world um, so yeah, he's um, a very a great, sort of great fun to write because you've got a, uh, and, and, and actually hard, the thing about, about character is, is when they're with somebody else, he's, he's hard to write on his own, but you give him somebody else and it's like it, it sort of zips and that's when it's fun yeah, that relationship. Often, doesn't he? Yeah, he Yes. Um, and certainly William, because William treats him with absolute sort of contempt really. Yeah. <laughs> he shouldn't like Samuel should not like him but in a weird way they're kind of bound together. I think I mean it, it, when you read it it, it it shows so well that you enjoy writing him because that you know the, the Samuel bits you know in particular I think just really zing off the page um, but actually I think that there's a lot of fun you had a lot of fun with real historical figures as well so mm. so so you mentioned Byron, and you've got Wellington, you've got Napoleon. Do you enjoy, how, do you enjoy writing about the, the real historical figures and giving them a sense of humour and getting under their skin as well, or is, it, is that different? I like, the, actually the most fun, and I think it was cut a lot, was there was quite a lot in, the orig, in, the, in an earlier draft with Byron. And Byron, and, and Byron was like William's older brother growing up. Because if you know a bit about Byron's history, with, the family parts of it where the family needed money really so there was um but but byron is kind of the cool um 
uh, person that, that could, cool character that William would probably sort of secretly aspire to be because he just shuns, you know, um, uh, 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 what's the, the word? He, he shuns life and responsibility, yes. and, and, and although didn't very much in later life, of course, but in, in the younger he was, he was sort of a debauched, uh, you know, he drank a lot, he slept around with, with anything, really, <laughs> um, and, um, and thoroughly enjoyed himself. And, and for William, who um, doesn't really, you know, hasn't even kissed a girl, um, would see bound. And William, one thing I'm really keen on with this is that he's bound by a lot of duties. He's, he's, I mean, he's, there's something intrinsically, something fascinating about somebody who is going to inherit, inherit a fortune like this with those responsibilities. Um, it's like there's there's an enormous amount of weight and responsibility that's put on their shoulders. Um, and they have to be a certain way, and it's interesting to play with, with that, and then see how they interact with other characters like Byron, who just goes and enjoys himself. <laughs> you know, so it's immediately there's going to be some um, some tension. Um, well, I enjoyed writing um, Wellington. I like the fact that um, it, Wellington is a family friend, um, an uncle. He's got lots of uncles. Um, which is something I remember very clearly when I was growing up. Everybody was an uncle, right? You know, it's like, oh, your uncle, whatever. So I thought it'd be just great if all of these historical figures were just his uncle. Mm -hmm. um, and I, he says at one point, I don't have any proper uncles, I've just got a lot of improper ones. But um, <laughs> the idea that it's, you know, he's in contact with all these incredibly sort of wealthy and influential uh, people, but he's only interested in whether they're going to bring in a present to his party because he's normalising that, you know, that contact. Um, Napoleon I struggled with actually, Napoleon had more space at the beginning than the final draft um, and I made him a little bit of a, of a too much of a comedic character so I, I dropped him, he was more um, more sort of exaggerated mm -hmm. and, and caricatured um, and perhaps I would have uh, wanted, I think if it hadn't have already been, I had to cut a lot out Right. Um, I would have had still had Byron in, in the you know if you could just if you're writing you just get what you want never mind about yeah. the fact that the story they're not pushing it forwards they're not driving narrative and all of these sort of you know writing tools that you're told that you have to do you just want that because it makes you laugh and it, it was it, it was hard to cut that out actually but um, and some of the other ones later on uh, Major Ross who was, who was part of the British Invasion Party and Admiral Cockburn. Admiral Cockburn, I have a great amount of a sort of perverse respect for because he's just the perfect leader. I made him as just a sort of with a slightly squeaky voice, but absolutely a, a clear leader. Sorry. Um, so, you do you do much research into the, that personality? Or you, it's difficult about personality because what you find it's hard to find that sort of yeah. information out. Yeah, and they're all romanticised, of yes, course. Yes, yeah. So they're all selling themselves as being this, I am this great leader and they'll stick an extra foot on. I'll give you but then I guess impression. that gives you free reign yeah. to kind of go with them however you know, shape them however you want to. Yeah, yeah. and I found, I found a great quote because I wondered about, you, you think, well, am I allowed to sort of exaggerate people? You know, just from a legal point of view. And then a, I can't remember where it was, but a statement that basically if you're dead, it's fair game. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought... Rock on. Yeah, there. yeah. Right. <laughs> but what I did do is just make sure that if, when I've read his, because I, I read history books, then suddenly I'll discover them, even halfway through the writing it, then suddenly I'll, oh, it's a book on Washington, that's brilliant, buy that. And, and, and as I read more, actually, what I found is if I read a proper history book now, it's my characters that I see on that page, and, and the events, even though I'm reading the same events, this point about changing history, there's still the same character. So it's everything still fits yeah. together. So you could actually, even though there's no comedy, you could um, read by the dawn's early light or whatever it was, or something, uh, one of these uh, the research books, um, you could read that. And actually, it's the same, mm -hmm. it's exactly the same characters in the same places. So I wonder, would you mind reading us a short bit? Would you like to hear a bit? Yes, <laughs> I'll read the, the um, this is technically my first reading. <laughs> I'll, read, I'll, read the, the, um, I'll read the preface. Um, the story of how Washington fell to the British doesn't begin aboard HMS Marlborough in the smoky grand cabin of Sir George Cockburn, Admiral of the British Fleet, nor does it start in Robert Banks Jenkins' cabinet office at Downing Street. Instead, it begins in the now-forgotten parish of Tornbridge, 
with a young, witless financier named William Peel. You may ask yourself why it took over 200 years for William Peel's ineptitude to make it into print, or indeed why anyone would dramatise William's exploits at all, considering that there are far more deserving and considerably less ridiculous historical figures um, who vanished into obscurity. The reason is very simple. The present Lord of Tonbridge's whereabouts uh, are unknown. Mayor Parsons, Tonbridge's most prominent figure, decided the time was right to set a few records straight, and in doing so, showed the world the kind of banality Tonbridge residents have had to put up with since 1729. In 1814, Tonbridge was a partially independent autocracy within the British Isles and had been home to the infamous Peel family for almost a hundred years. By the late 18th century, the Peels were reputed to be the wealthiest family in the world. With banks, as we understand them today, being scarce, the Peels were a ready source of finance with very few questions asked, subject to favourable terms, of course. Secretly, the Peels funded Emperor Napoleon's campaigns in Europe, the copper cladding of the hulls of Nelson's fleet uh, before Trafalgar, not to mention staking the odd theatre production and romantic novel. The Peels were, as President James Madison put it, the grease that kept the parts moving, although he did later accuse William Peel of greasing some parts more than others. <laughs> the Peel influence was never more prominent than in the spring of 1814, when Britain was at war with both uh, America and France, which side prevailed would be determined by their finances. Napoleon had been backed by the Peels from the start, and in the spring of 1814, Sir Charles Peels committed further funds for the Emperor's long-planned invasion of Britain. In exchange, the Peels would get almost a fifth of England and secure complete independence for Tornbridge. In truth, Napoleon only wanted Britain as a holiday home, and once he'd stripped her of her navy, he would give the rest to his brother Joseph as a compensation for losing Sicily. There was to be one twist of fate, however, one unforeseeable turn of events that would jeopardise Napoleon's plan. Sir Charles Peel, the adventurer, inventor and philanthropist, died of smoke inhalation on April 20th, 1814, on the eve of his son's 18th birthday. The great manor house and almost all of its priceless contents were ravaged by a blaze that took all night to extinguish. William, Sir Charles's only child, suddenly took the helm of a business empire that determined world politics. Unlike his father, however, who was shrewd, clever, diplomatic and respected, William Peel was a vain, pompous, well, sorry, William Peel was vain, pompous and a constant disappointment to his mother. The thought of William being at the helm of anything bigger than a toy sailboat struck fear into politicians' hearts and caused emperors, kings and queens to rush for the brandy. William Peel may not have had the cunning of Napoleon or the courage of Wellington, but what he had made him even more dangerous. He was a buffoon with the largest personal fortune the world had ever known. Right. <laughs> so you've got a, I mean, you've carved out a, a, a career as a screenwriter. Mm -hmm. um, did, did you always want to write a novel, or was this something that's come out of the screenwriting experience that you wanted to try a different medium, or...? Um, where, where was, does this sit? It was sort of, uh, I'd I reached a point just before writing this where I had two failed sort of stall productions which would have been um, uh, sort of cinema films. One a British comedy about the first woman to play snooker at the Crucible, quite timely actually considering it's on at the moment, and the other one was a big blockbuster um, adventure, big budget thing. Both have been stored for, for various reasons, some finances, some for other reasons. Um, at the time, I was, um, uh, I'd lost the, the point I mentioned earlier before, because I was filming about pitching at the Screenwriters Festival and hoping that that would lead and unlock to extra finance to the film. That didn't work out either. Um, and I've sort of, between these four walls, got a little bit jaded with the fact that with a lot, I spent a lot of time where budget is important. It's like, oh, this is very expensive. What about, you know, instead of doing a, an intergalactic space, whatever it is, why don't we film it in a school in Wales? <laughs> or, you know, those sort of commercial decisions that steer you. And, and I've, I started to get a collection of screenplays which were valuable if they were ever made, and I got a credit out of them, but starting to look like they weren't. Um, so I, th I thought, do you know what, I, 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 want, I want something finished that's that grand. Mm -hmm. You know, I felt like I 
had earned that. Um, so I, I sort of set myself the challenge of saying, do you know what, forget about any kind of budget, make it as big as, you know, as possible. Um, and then see what happens, really. So it was, it was a bit of a personal choice and a, a voyage of discovery. Um, I think what made it difficult, I did a very first draft, but he sort of, it's, it's like a moment where you go, I'm going to write a book. <laughs> I'm going to be a writer. Yeah. I'll put the kettle on, get the biscuits out. Yeah. Yeah. Off I go. Now, yeah. world, world, get ready, because yeah. I'm going to write a book. Yeah. And then the reality hits you, uh, of course, and I started writing. I got, I got an old um, uh, sitcom I worked on a long, long time ago with YTV, I think it was. And they never got made. It's always a bridesmaid. And I thought, you know what, I really like that. And it was actually, it was the same kind of dynamic as this. So it's, right. it was sort of a William and Samuel. It was a sitcom that, that featured those. But in a, it's, it's not quite recognisable it's in here, but it's, I know it's the same thing. So I thought, I'm going to take that out of the drawer and I'll just write a novella. I'll just, you know, do a, just write, not to sell or do anything with it, but just have a go. So, and I loved this, the, um, this uh, screenplay. Um, so, I'm, okay, do I indent the first bit? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going back to it. the bookshelf. I get it. The book, another, like another novel out of going like, yeah, okay. <laughs> That's it. Okay. Do we speech marks is speaking? Do I have to go on a new line? It's a wonder we've got this, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it was, and it was that. I was dyslexic in the seventies, where he thought that if you if you there's no such thing, then you were just stupid. So I, my English classes, this is absolutely true. In high school, some of my English classes were cutting things out of an Argos catalogue and sticking them on a page and writing the name underneath it. It was that sort of level of so. So to me, then to go because I never did anything in relationship in uh, sort of um, literature or actually proper writing, even though I got a master's in screenwriting. It's, it's not the same writing, it's technical. It's a, a screenwriting is a technical art as opposed to flowing and writing, you know, prose. Um, so I was just, so anyway, I, I, I sort of did that in the, just looking at the different options. Do I do double speech marks, single speech marks? So I did single speech marks and then I got to, um, it is, oh, apostrophe S, oh, it looks like I've stopped speaking then. <laughs> How does that work? That's crazy. <laughs> so it was sort of that exercise. And I did, I, so I did the whole thing and then I sort of put it in a drawer for a little bit um, and then took it out and read it and I hated it. I'm like, that's just rubbish. That is just, and I don't want to spoil what I loved as a story by putting, investing in more time and losing that sort of, you know, pleasure of it. Um, and about the same time, I think I then got the fact of the, the, of the story of Washington and of what happened. So I thought, well, okay, let's just start again. And so I, I um, started looking at uh, grammar. I didn't even know the basis of how to structure a sentence and how grammar works and, you know, how you, you sort of weigh where commas go. So I'm just throwing commas in all over the place. Um, so I got, anyway, I got some, I got kind of a rough draft to start with. Um, for the, uh, the Washington chunk of it, the invasion of Washington. Um, and it wasn't funny at all by this point, by the way. The comedy, it wasn't intended to be comedy. It was more a, a sort of a historical walk through the, the events. Um, and um, and it just sort of happened. It's one of those, those, I think, interesting things that stories happen where they just something adds on and, and re-evaluates how you look at the, the the finished product in mind and how it's going to be, but it was it was a lot of I think uh, YouTube is a marvel. <laughs> Watching kiddies grammar programs on you know the thing I don't know what the age of learning is, but just great. Like, <laughs> 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 like what about semicolon? When should I use a semicolon? <laughs> and it was that start from literally start from scratch and making pages of rules for the writing, and then that sort of unlocks then the confidence in, mm -hmm. in understanding how you, you, you do the description. Dialogue, not a problem. Always been and a very good dialogue tutor. It taught me really good how to do dialogue really well. So I'm happy with dialogue. And you, once I get talking, it doesn't matter. I've got that nail. I don't mean that in an arrogant way, but you just know your strengths and your weaknesses. 
Um, but it was the pro-lutage course in the majority of the story. It's like, I'm fine with dialogue, uh, but there's not that much, really. <laughs> okay. um, so, yeah, it, um, uh, it was uh, by trial and error, really. It wasn't... And, and I've ne I didn't have a like, big plan about sort of publishing it. I think perversely I did. Maybe, mm. you know, maybe subconsciously I did, but I just wanted to be able to try and do it as a book before I got to that point. But, and you, so originally you hadn't planned for it to be funny? No, no. So where, how did that come about? Um, well, the first draft, actually the first draft, when I got, I, I, I introduced William, got it to a point where it's pretty much recognisable today. Um, and the, and it, but it was the, still the same character as I've done in the sitcom. And I'd, I'd, I'd given the book, I'd done it as like an e-book, and gave it to um, a friend of mine who reads a lot. He's not, he's not a critic or any sort of, he just reads, a real prolific mm -hmm. reader. And said, just have a look at that, will you? And, and it's like a few days, he'd sort of thundered through it. Um, I said, right, what do you like, what you don't like? He said, um, I really like the, and he, he picked out certain, I won't say what they had, if you've not seen it, but uh, you've not read it, but there's certain bits which are a little bit sort of, um, uh, how, how would I put it? They're unsubtle. <laughs> it's like, it's, you know, it's bum toilet gags, whatever. They, they like some of the stuff that was really unsubtle. And I was like, well, I turned that down because I thought, I thought it was not, it's like, no, I think that's funny. I think you've got to, I like that bit. So that was a, 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 a bit of a red rag for me then. I was like, okay, I'll tell you what, I'm going to do it again and just go, you know, all out and, and make it, as, just make it as funny as possible. So I had another, probably another two or three sort of drafts. Um, where I was just trying to get all of that yeah. you know, comedy out of it as much as possible and his character out of it. I think it's very funny and it's very epic as well. In fact, you know, the global reach of it is huge. Um, and, and, and it's based in the matter too. So mm. did, were there skills that you learned through your screenwriting that you think were actually particularly useful in terms of actually then producing a novel? I think the... the, the uh, dialogue, even though it's not the cinematic part of it, I think dialogue is um, is hugely important mm -hmm. um, to, to 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 get, especially with comedy, because I think if it, it, it's you have to get because a lot of the comedy, especially in the character stuff, of course, is in the way that they say things. So you you've got to get succinctly get that gag across. So yes, in relation to, um, to, to comedy, in terms of scale. I was probably sticking two fingers up to the um, sort of almost as a film industry, like going. Do you know what? I'm going to make it as as broad as right. possible. So yes. I'm going to have I'm, I'm going to have the White House um, <laughs> on fire. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have the Hall of Representatives. You know, the, the the great bastion of sort of you know American. That I'm going to have that uh, the glass cascading down the front of there and being shot to bits by the, the British and and the whole thing. Um, a blaze. So yeah, it was it was where possible, absolutely uh, roll out all of the uh, how to frame it. Really, I think that from yeah. a cinematic point of view, yes, is, yeah. yeah, it's framing it and saying, right, I'm not, I'm not. It's not a, a, a film, but actually, it's it is grand enough in scale that um, it's a big budget book. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, really expensive pages. <laughs> So, but you took quite a, you took an interesting route to publication. So you, you had, so we mentioned earlier at the very beginning that it was on Orthonomy, the Harper yes. Collins site. So, ha, can you just explain a little bit about what Orthonomy is yeah. and how that came about? It, it's ended now. Actually, it was a great platform. I was very nervous about any online. I didn't blog, didn't do anything like anything online at all. No Facebook, Twitter, whatever. Um, but I found this thing called Orthonomy, which is Harper Collins slush pile that's managed by its own readers, in fact, worldwide. Um, and so what they do is you upload your book, and, it, and there's about I think there's twenty or twenty or thirty thousand at a time. It's a ridiculous number. So you you have a sort of ranking on your book. It's like thirty thousand. Oh my god! And then you sort of get involved with the chat room stuff and and, and share experience, and and then. You people get to hear about the book, and, mm -hmm. and you start to climb up. Um, so I thought, I, I thought, well, this is—I've got something to sell here because I'm, I can, I can tutor. So it'd be great. I'll just go on and then help people with the 
think I would the stories the same as I would do as a consultant, really. Uh, no, didn't really work. Because <laughs> people who come to you wanting advice are better than those that, that you offer advice to. And the idea is you critique their book and add comments such as that. Uh, but some people are more open to it than others. So I sort of waded in the first few, gave people a good critique of their book, and it was then I got some really like nasty sort of replies, like, you've broken my heart, why are you? Like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so immediately like, I'd be getting like one ranking or something because they, they click how much they like it. So anyway, to cut a long story short, and it is a long story because it was about 12 months, um, I got to number one as, um, as, a, as a book, uh, which means you reach the editor's desk and then Harper Collins read it. Um, and I also got to be the number one, uh, I don't really know what it means, but like the number one recommender in the book, so the contributor, sorry, to the site mm -hmm. um, in the world as well. Um, so that means that you, you, you can spot good books, because you like a book, you put it on your bookshelf, and then because it's on your shelf and the more shelves books are on, the higher it climbs. So it's, the, I don't know the algorithm, but it's that sort of thing. Um, so it climbed up to number one, Harper Collins read it. It took quite a long time to come back with a review and then a the review, which is the one that's on the back. And the, the extract of it is, William Peel is a brilliant, brilliant character, an aristocratic, aristocratic buffoon, he can speak as well, um, so wealthy is beyond reproach, and, blah, blah, blah. And, it, and so they loved it, so like, we want to read it. And normally, some of their reviews, if they think it was rubbish, they didn't give you house room. So it's like, fantastic, all of my peers and friends I've made on the site were like, go get them. So that was that, and it was sort of, there's the, there's the book. Um, it took probably another 12 months, literally, a bit shorter 12 months, for, for Harper's to eventually then get back to me after I tested them as well. Um, and um, within that period, or around that period, the announcement had just come out that Harper's had shut down phonomy, so they were no longer looking at, at uh, reviewing working on projects. I got an e a nice email back from them saying um, it's a difficult fit, we love it, it's been up and down the stairs a few times, but it's, it's a tough sell. Um, so because of that, I actually, what you do in autonomy is you don't, it, when you publish your review that they give you, it goes to loads of different people. Um, I, but I didn't, I deliberately didn't publish the review until I knew the time was right to publish it. I could, I had it myself because they sent it in an email. So actually what I did is I cut and pasted it into somewhere on the site and then sent people to it. But the actual notification system that goes to sort of agents and all sorts of stuff, I didn't send out. So when I got the, 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 uh, the, the sort of kickback letter, I published the review. When I got approaches then from mainstream publishers, not big ones like Harper's, but um, but ones that were still reasonable sizes. But I, I, I didn't really understand the terms and conditions. It felt like I was going to be doing all the work for, for very little return, really. They'd say, well, we'll do an editorial for it, you know, we'll, we'll sort of edit it, and we'll do your book cover, and we'll, mm -hmm. um, and then you uh, you don't give you any money up, you know, they don't, I don't pay any money up front, but any amount they pay seemed really quite small, I thought. Um, I mean, it's just I wasn't realistic. I'm going, I'm going to publish a book. I'm going to give up work <laughs> for years. You know, that'll be it. I could just bomb around Europe for two years worrying about what, ne what the next one is I'm going to write, do it on my advance, because that's what I've you know, heard happens. Um, and it wasn't, I can't remember the amount, but it was like, I don't know, five grand or something. It was like, I can't work for that. Um, and then, of course, they own... The, uh, they get a proportion of the, the money as the sales as well. So I thought, well, you know what, I can do that myself. Really. I don't need a big publisher to, or any publisher to do that for me. Um, why not do it myself? And I think with these, it's, there's, there's like layers of decision making where you sort of go, I'm never going to be able to write a novel. So suddenly I've overcome that. Um, nobody's going to like it. But actually, I sort of proved that they will. Um, I'm not going to be able to self-publish. I don't even know how the heck to do it. And then it was that when you go, I'm being brave here, but I can, I can do it. I've already done the other bit that I didn't even think I could do. And, and, and actually, the other side was, um, I've, I've done quite a lot of cover art, so book cover design for other people and uh, for other authors. So I thought, um, why not design my own cover? It's like a, I know it's a no-brainer, but you just go, why not just design my own cover then? 
So then the next step was suddenly then it was edit editorial, you know, actually, what do I do because I'm dyslexic? So that was then trying to rope in other people and, and you guys helped out immensely um, to just go and get the, you know, the sort of the bits I can't do on my own. I can't proofread a 120,000 word book in me because I just miss it. And I tried it. I've even got a machine that it reads, you know, the Mac, if you put it on speech, it reads the text. I've got it read and I'm reading it out loud and I'm still missing stuff because that's just yeah. the way I am. Um, so I need help with that process. So it was... But I think even if, I mean, even if you're, you know, even if you know the book inside out, or you, you know, you, I mean, the amount of times that I write stuff and then actually, you know, look at it and I've read it 17 times, 18 times and think, oh, actually, I have a second. I'm, I'm, I'm still, I've still smelled mm -hmm. something wrong. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think we do need someone else to kind of like give it a, a good looking at that's independent to you, mm -hmm. fresh, fresh, fresh eyes. But how, so how did you actually get it? You talked about like the editing of it a little bit and like the cover design, but how did you actually go about getting printed? And you, did you use a, uh, an independent self-publishing printer? No, well, what sort of what I, what I did first was if you if you do it through um, uh, if you do it through Amazon. Oh, actually, I'll take a little bit of a step back because one thing I missed out of this story is I did publish a couple of novellas because I decided right. that I took a step back and then went, okay, what. What do I need to know of the skills to do this? So I planned well in advance, and and so I set up an account on Amazon. I wrote a couple of novellas based on the old sitcom that I'd done, so the, the um, which I'd written under the name of Tornbridge. Um, so there was there was two episodes of the sitcom that I actually made into novellas, which is like fifty or sixty pages, um, in and amongst all this. Because obviously I'm waiting for stuff to come back. It's like twelve months with Harper's, and, and I know I'm thinking if they don't go for it then, you know, maybe I'll self-publish. Um, so I, I thought I'm going to need a skill set and I'll need to... So I've, I've made some friends with... with Because the great thing about autonomy is actually professional authors use it for some stuff as well. It wasn't just, you know, people that wanted to, to, to just write. It's people, you know, what, with any writing or with any writers, you need a community of writers to, to basically buy your stuff as well. So some people use it, you know, successful authors use it as a means to talk to their sort of fan base of the yeah. writers. So um, so I, I, um, uh, I did a couple of novellas. Um, sales were pretty dreadful, to be honest with you, but I learned a lot about the process. Um, and then I decided that I needed it's paperback. And that's the challenge. If you want to do an e-book, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you can just upload it, same as a sort of Word file, onto uh, Amazon. It's a doddle. Really is not that I'm doing on sales pitch for Amazon, but it is. If, you know, you just need some cover there. Um, and uh, but if you want to do a paperback, it's that's the difference. So and that's what I wanted to do because I was a friend of mine who's a writer was giving me advice saying paperback adds great credibility mm. to an ebook. So um, and plus as well, I wanted to see it. You know, yes, wanted, yeah. there's that satisfaction that even if there's only one copy, I want to have a copy yes. and see it there. So you know, occasionally somebody come out of the house and go. Mm. Uh, you know you had a book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to buy it? I've got hundred upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it was. Um, uh, 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 so I decided that that uh, I would use the sort of consultancy, Click Imaginations, actually as a publisher, so registered publisher with um, Nielsen. Mm -hmm. and bought uh, ten ISBNs. You can buy them in batches. I need ten. Um, Does this mean this is going to be a whole series of these? Or? Well, but yeah, I'd started with this. I'd already started plotting the second one as well, um, but I'd, I'm still adamant as well. It's going to be based on sales. If this, when the sales get up to a, a, a sort of reasonable threshold, then I would probably that's then, the trigger. That's the trigger for me <laughs> because it, you know it's such a long piece of work to do it to, to commit, um, and it's not because I don't enjoy it. I don't enjoy the characters, but you've got to. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's not that you necessarily want the sales because the money, but the sales mean reading. And it's feedback and stuff like this. Yeah. It's so lovely. You just want to know that people are enjoying it and the, you know, they read it and they put some feedback on Amazon and you go, wow, that's lovely. And that's, it's sort of that that you get. But perversely, you're only going to get that if it's something that people yeah. want to read. So it's, you know, it's not a material sort of money thing with it, although that's always, you know, always nice. It's about the fact that people are enjoying it. Does anyone have any questions? Was it not quite scary then to move off from doing um, 
screenwriting and all your other jobs and concentrate on that? Or did you carry on all your other jobs? I carried on all the, I carried on the other job. I went back to uh, a sort of normal job, you know, normal career, um, and then wrote this in uh, as a, I suppose like I did when I first started out, really, which is you just fit it into you. You write first thing in the morning or write in the evening, and you just you fit things into your life. And it's it's amazing how much you can do like that, really. Um, certainly, I would say pre-kids, having a four and a half year old to write anything. It's sort of going like this in the office. Don't they? <laughs> <laughs> iPad, turn the iPad off. Right. I'm in the middle of a, a, a I'm in the middle of a PC I'm in Washington, I'm not here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Find your mother. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's a great bit actually. When I first got, when I when I first when I got the first copy, um, I, de I, I deliberately opened it with the family, so I got a proof copy. So the thing came from Amazon, the same way that if you bought it, it, it comes through in that brown thing. Mm -hmm. So I got the camera set up and filmed the lad ripping the thing off like that and holding it up. And it's a wonderful little clip. Um, and he sort of holds it up and says, "What's this?" And he's, he sort of says, "Daddy's book." Washington about and he says it. I primed him, I've cued him what he says. <laughs> but he, he says it and it's really cute. Um and that was a lovely family moment. And then of course it's like, well, that doesn't work, I'll need to check and I get another proof. So I'll try the same one here, you want interested. <laughs> He's already seen it. It's like no. Is the iPad on yet, Dad? <laughs> so if somebody orders it as a paperback, is it like a print on demand or yeah. yeah. Um it's it's um it's made in America. Well, I think they have them in, in, in Europe. Um, so it's printed abroad and then uh, distributed here. You can, there's several different ways you can do it. Some, uh, but print on demand, I think, was the best thing that, that suited me. Although it has its, it has its pros and cons as a, as a physical book. And there's limitations in relation to, to design and quality, to be honest, um, that you have. But it's it's probably as good as you can, you know, as I can imagine you could get for, for the fact that somebody could order one in, in two weeks or whatever um, the thing comes through as a, you know, that, I think that's quite remarkable really, and it's empowering for, for writers. I think it came through, like mine came through in like maybe three days. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. mine did. Mm. Although the first one, yeah. Yeah, that we shredded or yeah, that we're missing. Shredded, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um but when when I contacted them and they sent me another batch, it was um, within a few days, so mm. it's very good. Well, I think it's very, very funny. It's a great read. It's it's, it's so much fun, so I think you should be incredibly proud of Thank what you. you've achieved here. And I think as we're almost out of time, can you please give Steve a round of applause? <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate thank you it. And again, thank you for you know your help as well because it's it, it, that meant a lot. How much of it is true then? Um, the whole part of um, the destruction of Washington is true. It, ha it's, it pretty much happens exactly as it's in here. Um, there's I, I haven't really I've not changed. And in fact, the only thing the only thing I've added that was never clarified is why. Why did Britain? Why did the British destroy and burn Washington? And there's a there's a bit in one of the history books about as they came into the uh, into Washington, there were there were um, shots fired from a, a house that was the militia, and it's actually in the book as the whole thing about the house then gets shredded. O only thing factually was that the house was there, that they opened fire on the British, and that the house was destroyed. Um, but what I couldn't get was I needed some reason for the British to actually ramp it up because it seemed a bit, I don't know, just weak if you sort of go, right, I'll go in and let's just set fire to it. So I invented the fact, which I think is quite plausible in the way it happened, is that the British sent in a small party first, beating the drum, which effectively is parlay. So they're going into an invading you know, they're intending to invade, but they're going into request terms on the parlour. And by opening fire, the militia, in effect, probably inadvertently because they were farmers and they wouldn't have known the rules of war, that was quite clear, um, that they would have, in the British's eyes, 
broken the rules of parlay and once you do that all bets are off so what i added was that there's a scene in it where william actually tells them that that's what we're doing that the you, you know the beating on the parlay and they don't care because they're just sort of they want to kill british and what you know why not i mean it was hot. the british basically when they went into Bland uh, uh, blandensburg before washington you know did you know destroyed it. it was war that's they, they marched and they, they shot up people who effectively were not professional soldiers but people who lived nearby who were farmers and um so i think there's there's going to be that excitement that gut sort of i just want some revenge and if you're in a you see a, a relatively small number of british walking past they don't think you've seen you they take a few shots but inadvertently i think probably changed the course of uh, of, of those events so other than that it's pretty i try to keep it pretty much as it as as it is of course the discussions between those parties involved that's fiction complete fiction because there isn't any uh, there isn't really anything documented in, uh, in that but even uh, it's pretty difficult going back to the point about um what do you keep right you, you, anything historic is a nightmare because it's like science fiction you say science fiction is the hardest thing i think i think history is and more so because in science fiction if you don't know that something is you can make up the technology you, you, it has a light come on well we just make it up mm -hmm. um in history especially this sort of period of history and worse so perhaps for yours because yours your period of history is so well documented this is slightly back from that but actually in, in a weird way also bad because it's not documented you can't go in and go what would you i mean i bought a historical book on uniforms because i've got to describe what people look like coming across the food i don't even know what they're wearing and you know the the line that i found out about the fact that the, the american militia because they wanted to formalize um their regiments if you like bought french or borrowed french uniforms which i thought was ironic and there is a point in the book that if you want to pick a uniform that the elite British forces are most used to putting bayonets in. Yes. You're going to do it with a French <laughs> uniform. Like, I don't think you thought that through, guys. <laughs> Come on, pick something more peaceful or something like that, but French. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, I do try and be true to it as, uh, as much as possible. Um, but it's, uh, and I found, we were talking earlier about, about do things like buildings hard because you america now because photographs didn't exist you've got no evidence so what you'll find is there's an old photograph of, uh, sorry an old painting of what the white house looked like burnt out or just the president's house as it was called then and um, it's only from one side so it's limited but that's the basis of how you describe it to the readers so it's it's sort of even what the leading is like or what the and, and say we were talking earlier because I didn't really I described it at first as having I can't remember if it's the portico that's on the front or the arch it's at the back because that's what I've seen as, as, a, as a picture and I, I bought a copy of um, quite late on in the day um, a copy of a, a book about the White House you know it's like a, like a touristy guide book of the White House so this thing arrived and then suddenly there's so and so present first lady stood in front of the new extension to the <laughs> new <laughs> that should have been there in, i've written that has been there in 1814 what do you mean new in 1960. <laughs> so uh so stuff like that gets um uh hard yeah and it's hard actually those are sort of things that are really hard to find because you don't think to look no you know you just kind of you make the assumption without even thinking that you're making an assumption you just kind of go with what you know you just go with it yeah and, and i always think as well it would be those things it would be people like that i always had in mind that there would be some very knowledgeable critic somewhere yeah. <laughs> that would suddenly leave a comment on amazon uh going like i think you'll find that in 1814 they wore blue hats you are incompetent go and die or something <laughs> because a friend of mine who'd done a, who'd done a historical book um, actually, and he thinks it was it was sort of fans of a competing book that had done it, or, or you know, the team of a competing book. They slated some of the, the historical stuff that he put in on, on the review, and it wasn't. He never he did it as a loose bit of fiction anyway. It was never that strict. But then, I, as soon as I'd seen that, he sort of you might as writers or anybody you email them. Oh my God, have you seen this? This is my late. This is the latest review. 
uh, what do I do? Do you know anybody that can buy the book and put a review up? <laughs> so this isn't the top. This isn't the top one. I'm like, no. All my friends have already bought your book. There's nothing that we can do. You just have to stand there. And it's like one star. This is, you know. But actually, so far, I'm just not going to make a whole terrible mistake that that's not happening. I'm hoping that people just read it and then go, that's very funny, and forget about the fact that I've actually just winged, you know, those bits in between I mentioned. That's the plan. <laughs>